Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I hope it was easier for you all to get up than it was for me this morning. I had some good time with my Dutch friends uh, yesterday evening. And I would like to talk about heat and tennis. And there's three questions I would like to answer today. The first question is, what are the current heat rules in tennis? Because there's some discussion what heat rule applied at the Australian Open. What is the effect of the 10-minute break? Because there's a 10-minute break uh, when the heat rules applied in women and junior tennis. And what does research tell us about um, tennis in the heat? The question we hope to answer is when to stop play when it's hot. At what temperature or at what WD? EGT. So what are the current heat rules in tennis? Well, when we look at the general rules of tennis from the International Tennis Federation, there are no heat rules. Yes, the referee may stop or suspend play when it's dark or when the weather, you know, when it's lightning or something. They may use it for heat, but generally there's no real heat rule. There's no heat rule in the men's circuit either. And there is no heat rule even for the ITF seniors. And as you know, they have seniors starting at 35, but going on till 85 and older, no heat rule. When we look at the ITF juniors, the women's circuit, the, the lower uh, female tennis game and the Fed Cup, the highest level, then there are heat rules. So uh, when the W2BGT is over 30 degrees, there's this 10 minute break between the second and the third set, but only if both players want this but they exclude the matches that are already in progress. So if it's too love in the first set and it heats 30 degrees, no heat rule apply. They may delay the starting of the game, but in the morning you don't always know how hot it's going to be that day. Then they have different rules for heat, uh, wheelchair tennis. They start at a lower temperature and then they have a 15 minute break because they say the wheelchair tennis players need more time then they can suspend play at the end of set when, the, when it heats, um, hits 30 degrees, and then there's immediate sus suspension of play when it hit, uh, hits 32 degrees. Then again, there's different rule for the ATP, the Association of Tennis Professionals, the male tennis players, and the WTA, the Women's Tennis Association, the women. <coughs> ATP, no heat rule. They say, we men are tough. The women, um, they can uh, have a 10 minute break at 30 degrees and they can suspend play immediately when it hits 32 degrees and they include the matches in progress. So here when it's too love and then uh, the heat rule applies, you can stop play. However, at the Grand Slams, they have different yeah. rules, heat rules yet again. So at the Australian Open, they use the old heat rule of W2BGT of 28 degrees, and then they had the 10-minute uh, the break for the women's and the junior singles matches. But then, and that's where some of the discussion, the debate arose, they said when the temperature is at a predetermined threshold, the referee may suspend play. But they didn't, they didn't tell them at what temperature that was. So there was a lot of debate going on because, as you know, the temperature hit 41, 42, 43 degrees, and the players didn't know when they were going to stop play. And they got a lot of bad publicity this year because with social media and television everything, everything was televised and people could see that there, were, there was heat illness, that people didn't feel very well, despite the fact that they said it was all going fine and there were not very medical timeouts. Why is this? Well, maybe because they've been struggling with it in the past. In 1998, they said, we stop play when it's 40 degrees, but we wait till the end of the match. They're already in progress. In 2002, they decided, no, no, 38. Then in 2003, they said, no, no, 35. And then they said, not excluding match in progress, but at the end of the set. And then they said, no, no, this is, this is too low and they said at the discretion of the referee. So you can see clearly they have been struggling with it, like we do, and that's why we're talking about it. So the current heat rules are different for the ATP, WTA, and ITF, different for men, women, wheelchair tennis players, and juniors. So let us look at the 10-minute at the break. What is the evidence? that the, What effect does it have? 
And there's one study that I could find in the literature. They looked at seven female tennis players at a temperature, wet bulb globe temperature of 30.3. And what they showed, the average drop was 0.25 degrees. The highest for the ones with the highest temperature and no effect for the one with a lower temperature. So this has only a very small effect. So maybe we should look at additional measures or other measures to cool the players on court. Maybe use fans, maybe use heat, maybe use more cooling. What else do we know about the research? Well, there are several studies. Bergeron has two studies in juniors, adolescents, but he mainly looked at the effect of um, hydration and he did find some effect. But as you can see, the the core body temperature, CBT, was not outrageous. It didn't, didn't go over, on average, over 30, uh, 39. Hornery, he looked at professional tennis players, and he found a difference in the core body temperature of the players on different type of courts. On hard courts, where he measured that actually near the court surface, the temperature was around 40 degrees, he found a slightly higher peak temperature of 38.9 compared to clay of 38.5. Moranta did a very interesting study in America, uh, sorry, in, at the, uh, in Australia, and she looked at, at a range of wet bulb globe temperatures from 13 to 30, and went deeper uh, with seven players, and we'll look at those slides later on. Then there's a study in the Netherlands. You know, in Netherlands it's not very hot, but we were very lucky that there was one day it was cool, wet bulb globe temperature of 9, and the other day it was 23.4. And as you can see here, is that the core body temperature was the same, so they were able to compensate for the environmental conditions, but the skin temperature was slightly different, 32 point here and 35.8 on the, on the hot day. And this was also repeated by Pierre R, who was who took Dutch tennis players and French tennis players to Qatar, and then had much higher um, wet bulb globe temperature. The cool day he called 19, and the hot day 33.6. And again, you see this different. He only measured uh, the thigh because there was some problem with, with all the patches, but 31.9 and 36.8. So much, much higher skin temperature. And we'll go into that later on. What Bowens found in the Dutch study, that there was a strong association between exercise intensity um, and core body temperature. After yesterday, of course, I don't dare to talk about exercise intensity any anymore, but that's what the best we had, the percentage of heart rate max. What you want to know is what the absolute amount of work was, what the absolute metabolic heat production was. Hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future. Then Morante, what she found was um, she looked at the rectal temperature here, and then the point duration as a measure of the, of the absolute workload, and she found a positive correlation. So when the points were longer, the core body temperature would go up. But when we look at tennis in the prescription zone, so when you can still compensate, we see there's no association between air temperature and, and core body temperature, as discussed already yesterday but now you also see it in tennis, and no association between wet bulb globe temperature and core body temperature. So the tennis players are able to compensate up to an air temperature of 40 degrees and up to a wet bulb globe temperature of 30. Then they have no problems, except the odd player here and the odd player here. We would like to know more about those players. What she did find is that there is a positive association between skin temperature and air temperature. So when the air temperature goes up, your skin temperature goes up. And this is important. It was discussed yesterday, but the highest skin temperature leads to more thermal discomfort. And what happens here, you can see here, the skin temperature goes up and players start feeling too warm. They don't feel comfortable anymore. What happens when they don't feel comfortable, it, it seems to lead to behavioral adaptation. And in this case, with Moranti, she found that when, the, when they started feeling hot, the point duration would go down. So in, from two seconds, on average, 
to would go down to sometimes eight seconds or more. So the players would hit the ball with more force, finish the point quickly. Or what they can do, and that is what Periyar found, what they, the point duration remains the same, but they take longer breaks. In cool weather, 18 seconds between points. In hot weather, up to 30 seconds between point. So their effective playing time, the amount of time that they were actually, the percent of time they were playing, goes up from twen um, goes down from 20 to 17 percent. So the players have different ways to deal with the heat. And what does research tell us? Well, first of all, metabolic heat production is much more important than air temperature or wet bulb globe temperature for the core body temperature within the prescription zone. So when they can still compensate. The skin temperature, that is positive correlated with the air temperature and thermal discomfort. And finally, players slow down when they feel hot. But what happened at the Australian Open? It was, it was much hotter. They were not able to compensate and player, play started to deteriorate. So you see that players start hanging around, waiting more for the matches. So what is the time to stop play? We know all these factors, convection, evaporation, the sweating, the radiation, the sunshine, the conduction, the direct transfer. Yesterday, I thought I knew the answer. I had written down on my paper, and then I heard all these talks, and it made me think even more. Why do we, why do we have this absolute temperature? Because we, should, it, we know it depends on, on several things. We know it depends on the body mass of the player, on the body surface air and mass ratio, their metabolic rate, their sweating capacity. And it's different. It's different for men, women, children, wheelchair tennis players. But how much? And that's a problem that we don't know that. We should stop play when the body can't compensate for the environmental condition. And the 10 minute break is not enough. We should look at different things. Maybe at the Australian Open, they have this for the public. Can they have it for the players at the, at the back of the court? Can they have fans? Can we have more cooling mechanisms? Can we have more shade? Suspension of play, we don't know. Yesterday I filled in 32 degrees wet bulb globe temperature and I filled in 40 degrees. I spoke to Oli Day and I erased it. I deleted it. We simply don't know. We need research. We need much more research in tennis and the number one priority would be to determine metabolic heat production. And I know a researcher I would like to do this study and the exchange of information at this conference is great for this. Thank you so much for your attention. And I know I'm within the time, because I always am. <laughs> I keep rushing, sorry about that. But if there's any question, I'm welcome to answer them. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. There, yeah? um, some question? Hi, Babette, thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Um, very interesting that you changed your uh, your answer after speaking with Ollie, um, and it's a very good point. But for example, well, given that we don't have the research yet, and we let's say we plan on doing it in the next few years, um, would you would you recommend a, a hard WBGT, for example, now to before you know as we do the research and then we figure out maybe a better better system or better way in, to, to protect the players for the next few years, for example? I think. As you can see at all the, what happened at the Australian Open, I do think you need to have an upper limit. And at the moment, I would, I would go for 32 Bud Bull globe temperature. That is what they were having in the past. But maybe in addition to just the Bud Bull globe temperature, in a situation where the humidity is so low, because at the Australian Open, at times it was only 15%, you should maybe also have an absolute limit of 40, 40 degrees Celsius max. Maybe, maybe, maybe 42, but it seemed like 42 was too high this year. Um, just a follow-up to that. Um, maybe a, a good solution, uh, a temporary solution, um, while we're figuring out exactly what the limit should be, is uh, above a critical WBG team limit of, let's say, maybe a little lower than the critical one that they're using right now, is that in the major tennis tournaments like the Australian Open, where it is a big risk, <laughs> Uh, or hypothermia is a big risk, is maybe uh, start actually measuring their core temperature. So if when we know we go above a critical limit, we say, okay, we know we've got, we've got uh, these players playing, 
give them a telemetric pill four hours before they start playing or however long we need for it to reach the gut and then actually monitor them throughout the game. And then we, you can actually use their actual data to make a real decision based on their, their responses at that particular time, maybe. That might be a good temporary solution, at least. It's quite, it's uh, logistically challenging, I recognize, but uh, I think it might be more evidence-based than having it at the discretion of a referee who presumably doesn't have the expertise to decide whether somebody is going to pass out from hypothermia or not. And the, the, the question is, of course, it, it's, it's very difficult with pro professional tennis players, and would it be enough to just have the core body temperature without the service? Because uh, the service product that caused some problems with players. Yeah, I wonder, though, if, uh, if core temperature is the measure you want. I know we often use that as a criteria, but the relationship between core temperature and heat exhaustion is almost non-existent. And, um, you know, heart rate's going to be increased as you play. So what do you measure? And, and I'm wondering, though, if, if the answer might be just more active cooling, just simple things like forearm immersion, those kinds of aspects during break. That that is something that was discussed. The problem is with tennis players that they need their hands. So with the, so if you yeah put them in the cold water, they feel that they, yeah they lose feeling a little bit, whereas it's it's ideal in other in other sports. Can I can I add to this discussion by saying this is very interesting to see look at the data from tennis players. I do think it's very difficult to measure cold temperature. If there is a value, it's very difficult to measure this in, uh, in professional players. But uh, why don't we follow the same approach that the first studies followed the, the USA Army Forces did this in uh, the 50s? They had measured WBGT during uh, many, many training sessions, and they are recording the heat illness. So that's how they created the different levels of thresholds. So I think we do need to, to start collecting in a consistent way this data, WBGTs, heat-related uh, illnesses, and then make a, uh, different statistical analysis to, to answer the question, what is the appropriate, which depends on the sport, on the sport yeah. and of course on the individual. Yeah. Then we need to individualize, which is another, another big topic, I think. But let's start from the, the first. Uh, yeah. They are collecting the data now. The ATP and WTA are collecting all the injury, da injury and illness data. The only thing you also have to be, um, they have to really be strict with the, uh, with the definition for, yeah, for heat, yeah, heat illness and heat exhaustion. Yeah. Just, so to follow up on the, sorry, just to follow up on the remark of George, so then that suggests that we could uh, use something else that would be a registry. Do you have that? Do you have any registry of all of the cases of heat illness or heat exhaustion that occur during the 10, 20, 50 past years and the condition in which they occur? What they do have now is, is um, um, yeah, an injury <laughs> registration system. So they, they do collect all the data of of every, every injury and every illness at the, ma at the major events, at the ATP and WTA events, where there are you know, physiotherapists available. But not for the last 50 years. No, no, no illness and the temperature, they go out three times a day to, to measure the wet bulb globe temperature at very specific times, so they have those data. Now to work with it and to, to publish it, that would be the next step. <laughs> Just a comment, that, and I have, I agree with you, that during the breaks you can create a cabin. I was thinking about the supermarkets where you have the food. It wouldn't be so expensive for, for the tennis association to create a cabin with the optimal environment where you cool the scheme and, and the temperature. You have to think, sometimes the index of core temperature that we have, they are not so fast as the blood. Blood temperature goes down within seconds uh -huh. and very quickly, and the magnitude is very, very high. So, so I'm not sure exactly what is the ideal ambient temperature to maximize the drop in, in temperature. I don't know whether it's 20 or so, but it is, hmm. that's, that's something that, uh, some ideas to follow up. That would be good, because we ma who made the drawing again yesterday of the tennis court? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Because it gets it gets very hot it gets very hot within the stadium and, and, and near the court and it would be a, ideal if you could cre create some different environmental conditions. I just want to uh, 
reinforce like you know in line with what might say that since you say that ambient temperature is not the key determinant, I don't think we should pay so much attention on the WBGT and we cannot affect how hard they play. So I think the only component we can affect is during rest. So I think that should be the focus and not the play, neither the environment, in terms of the emphasis. To, to cool during the rest yeah, period. Yeah, I, I think that should be the, the critical period, you know, where you think to, to lengthen the rest or do more things, you know, during the rest, but not so much on WBGT, I don't think so. Yeah. Expand the rest periods, yeah? Another question? Uh, well, just a comment very briefly. Just with, the, just with in terms of temperatures to, to use to, to cool down and how long it takes, because the 10 minute rule, like, like you mentioned, they, they went down by 0 .2, 0 0.025, whereas in our study, we had a, a 25 minute break between the, the first and second hour of play to do some testing. And even in the heat, uh, they went down uh, by 0.4, um, degree core temperature. So even in hot conditions, if you stop play, I mean, 25 minutes is a long break, but like you said, you know, Jose, in like a cooler environment, 20 degrees or something, they could probably cool down much more rapidly. Yeah, because you stop your work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. <laughs>